In the fall of 1863, following this campaign, Custer comes back to Monroe, Michigan, a hero. Uh, the press finds him good copy and writes several newspaper articles about him. He is a brigadier general now, has one star on his shoulder, is a courageous leader, very popular, and he continues to court Libby Bacon. Now, the chief rival, or the, the chief obstacle, I should say, the chief obstacle in Libby's proposed marriage to George Armstrong Custer is her father, Judge Daniel Bacon. Now, Daniel Bacon only had one child, Libby, and he was very selective on who could uh, court her, or which suitor would be uh, proper for her. And before Gettysburg, Custer was not considered a very good suitor for Libby. First of all, he was the son of a blacksmith, so he was in the wrong class. Second, he was a soldier, so his life expectancy was short, and he was uh, in the wrong profession. And third, he was a staunch Democrat, and Bacon was a Republican, so he was in the wrong political party. But following Gettysburg, Custer comes back, a national hero and a brigadier general, commander of a brigade, and finally Libby Custer had worn her father down and just told him that this was the man that she was going to marry, and Daniel Bacon listened to her. So Custer gets an extended leave into the spring of 1864, and the Custers are married at the First Presbyterian Church on February 9th, 1864. And after a short honeymoon to West Point and to uh, New York City and then back down to Washington, D.C., Custer rejoins the Army in Virginia in the spring of 1864, leaving Libby in Washington at a boarding house. Now, once uh, Custer comes back to the Army, he has a new commander, uh, General Alfred Pleasanton, who had been his ultimate patron in the war, who had helped him secure his brevet brigadiership, has been shipped out of the Army and has been sent west. So now there's a new ar commander for the cavalry, and it is five foot four Major General Philip Sheridan. Now Sheridan and Custer, when they first met, took to each other immediately. They had the same type of personality, so they got along automatically. Uh, Sheridan would be like Pleasanton and would be Custer's ultimate protector. Under Sheridan's command, Custer racks up serious victories in the South in 1864. They defeat Jeb Stuart at Yellow Tavern, Virginia, and one of Custer's soldiers actually mortally wounds General Stuart in the battle. So that is a crushing defeat and a crushing loss for the South. In the Shenandoah Valley, Custer and his Michigan Brigade once again uh, defeats the Southerners again and again. And at Tom's Brook, Custer actually defeats his uh, West Point classmate, Tom Rosser, who was a Texan and scatters uh, Rosser's men and captures all his guns and it's, it becomes known as the Woodstock Races. After the Battle of Tom's Brook, uh, Major General Phil Sheridan uh, has an opening in the 3rd Cavalry Division and he petitions to have Custer move up in rank and to take over that position and it is accepted by Congress. So in 1864, following the Battle of Tom's Brook, George Armstrong Custer goes from Brevet Brigadier General to Brevet Major General, and he is now commanding the 3rd Cavalry Division, a force of more than 6,000 men. It's a couple different brigades now. So he went from one brigade now to at least two, and he's commanding a division, and he's got another star on his shoulder. So Custer's doing very well. We get into 1865, the cavalry moves to Richmond and Petersburg defenses. The Confederates are hemmed in around those two cities, and it's basically been a long nine-month siege. At the Battle of Five Forks in April 1865, Custer and other cavalry units and one corps of the Army of Potomac of Infantry defeats the left wing southwest of Petersburg and starts the retreat from Richmond and Petersburg to Appomattox. Um, as the retreat occurs through uh, two Appomattox, they run through Jetersville. A uh, group of the Confederates rear guard is caught by Custer and other cavalry units and another infantry unit, uh, the Second Corps, at the Battle of Sailors Creek, and they damage it severely, capture tons of prisoners and major generals and generals and colonels, and it's just a terrible loss for Lee. 
and Custer is one of the first units, cavalry units, to actually block the Confederates' retreat as they try to get through Appomattox Courthouse, as well as the Army of the James under General O.C. Ord. Finally, on April 9, 1865, Palm Sunday, General Lee decides to surrender to Grant. He is nearly surrounded. He has lost, I believe, uh, at least a quarter or third of his army since the Petersburg or the Five Forks disaster. And Lee surrenders to Grant at the McLean House in Appomattox Courthouse. Now Custer actually had accepted the first uh, terms of surrender, or, or the first flag of surrender, the truce flag. So an officer had come up to him with a flag of truce, a white flag, and, and wanted to signify, you know, the, the end of the, the battle. And Custer was doing other things during the day. He got word of the surrender uh, later on, the formal surrender later on. He was not in the house where the surrender took place. He arrived later, ended up uh, waiting on the porch until the ceremony was over. Uh, one of the men that was in the room was General Philip H. Sheridan, the Major General and patron of George Armstrong Custer. Uh, following the surrender, once it was over, Sheridan purchased the table on which the surrender terms were written by General Eli S. Parker, which was uh, the chief of staff, I believe, of General Grant, full blood Seneca Indian. Uh, he had written the terms out on this table and given them to Grant, and both Grant and Lee had signed them. Uh, General Sheridan bought that table from William McLean for $20 and presented it to Libby Custer as a gift. And he also wrote a little note, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it basically said something like, uh, Dear Madam, scarcely an individual in this uh, service has brought about this very desirable event than your very gallant husband. So he signed it Philip H. Sheridan and presented this surrender table to Libby Custer as a gift signifying that George Armstrong Custer was a major player in the southern defeat and the southern surrender at Appomattox and the end of the war in general. So that's pretty much it. The war is over. General Custer He's a major general, a brevet major general, which is a temporary rank. He had started as a second lieutenant. He had been wounded only a couple times in the war, and they were both minor. He had had 11 horses shot out from under him, and he had won almost every major battle that he had fought in. So he had done very well. At this point, he is 25 years old, and with the war over and him being a national hero, Custer has a decision to make. Who's he going to be now? And we will get to that in a few minutes.